Hi, welcome to the Polyvagal Podcast. This episode is a great place to start. It is the most exciting episode for me by far. I got the absolute pleasure and privilege of being able to interview Dr. Stephen Porges. He is the creator of the Polyvagal Theory, the science that has helped uh, so many of us in the helping professions to work with our patients and our clients more effectively. It's not only benefited me on a professional level, but on a personal one as well. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist who is obsessed with the polyvagal theory. Welcome to episode 15 of the Polyvagal Podcast. Okay, my fr- so you be, you joined the family of polyvagal people. Oh my God, I, I can't help but. Yeah. <laughs> um, about last year in July is when I first stumbled upon it, and it was just this instant uh, you know, connection. I, I was looking for ways to work better with, I work with kids in school district, um, and just working for ways, how can I do better with trauma work? And I found somatic experiencing, and then that led me to the polyvagal yeah. theory. And it was just this instant connection of like, oh, there it is. That's the piece I'm missing. Okay. Do you want to do any intro or anything, or if, do you want to do it later? I want to maximize my time with questions, okay. if I may. <laughs> sure. um, and I can easily do an intro later on, okay. unless you love hearing about all your accolades. Nah, <laughs> no, no, no. I am, I'm very comfortable. Um, and I don't mind talking about really what you're bringing up, and that is how you saw the theory as helpful in understanding what you were doing in your job, in your yeah. world. Yeah, it, it's and it was it was an in, like I mean, just absolute instant. I can't even describe what came over me, but it was just this like pieces falling into place. Yeah, and, as well as an avenue for change and hope. And it was like now, now this is really clicking. Yeah, well, again, we're going to kind of discuss that because what you were doing is your body was telling you this this makes sense. It's intuitive. So you're actually in my world, your neuroception was saying this is this is a pathway to understanding and understanding comes from feeling safe with ideas and thoughts. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have all your answers, but it gives you the scaffolding to start to approach it. Absolutely. And, and polyvagal theory, as it evolved and developed for me, did the same thing. It, it enabled me to understand the world I was in, but it also enabled me, just as you said, to start thinking about what are the portals that we have to optimize human experience. Not in the sense to change and to manipulate behavior, but to optimize what it is to be a human being and to enjoy that. And I, I think that's what you were uh, alluding to. I I can't disagree with you there. And when I talk about this with teenagers, I even talked about this with a first grader mm-hmm. on a very simple level. And he was like, yeah, that's how I feel. That's, I feel like running away. That's it right there. Yeah. And teenagers well, get it immediately. Well, the magic word in your phrase is that's how I feel. Mm. And when I kind of stepped back and said, okay, polyvagal theory has all its complexity, but what is it really doing in its applications into the clinical sciences? And remember, before polyvagal theory, everything was emphasizing events. It was focusing, yes. basically creating a documentary of human event. And what polyvagal theory does, it creates the documentary of human feelings. It's not that events yeah. aren't important, but we have to, in a sense, be witness and witness others' feelings. Is, is feelings... If, when we say feelings, usually we mean sadness and happiness and whatnot. But we're talking about body, feelings, <laughs> yeah. neuro uh, that kind of stuff, right? Well, it, it's it's good for you to bring up the words because we, wherever we sit, we actually have a vocabulary that goes with our 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 little niche. Uh, right. To me, feelings are, is a psychological term that sits on top of autonomic regulation or autonomic yeah. state. So, to me, feelings are. Uh, bodily changes, how our body feels. It's it's in our gut. We may not always have a succinct language for it, but we know that something's happening in our body. And that's really where polyvagal theory says, let's respect that. And let's understand that those feelings actually influence how we see the world and how we react to others. Yeah. Do you, do you the way I've kind of framed this in my mind is that the feelings of things like sadness that, that I think the way you put it is on top of, or that it's, I don't want to say secondary, but it comes along with maybe yeah, the free I, state. Well, let's build on it. it okay. If we th- think in terms of an inverted triangle, I always do this or take my glasses, yeah, yeah, yeah. hold them upside down. And in the apex down there, 
That's the brainstem. And the brainstem is where the regulation of our bodily state occurs and the effect of our bodily state uh, goes up and affects our brainstem. And our brainstem now, on top of it, has all these other brain structures, but those brain structures, what they can do, are in part limited by the state that the brainstem is in. So the issue is if we have feelings of sadness or actually feelings of grief or feelings of uh, lack of safety, defensiveness, our body is in a different way. It's a different body. And we can't, if, since you work in a school system, we know that you don't yell at a kid who can't relate. You don't, it doesn't make them relate better. Well, it's not helpful. <laughs> it happens, well, but it's not helpful. Well, it's also like a child that is irritable and can't sit still. You don't just restrain them and yell at them and say, look, um, we'll reward you if you sit still. It's not a volitional intentionality, and that's part of what we have to start to learn, that many of the observables that we have in our human behavior are not, uh, in, it, they're not intentional. They just manifest. So people who are very, very anxious, and as we get older, we see that there are people who were anxious when they, if you if you know them for several decades, they were anxious as their kids, they're anxious as they were young parents, they're anxious as they're old, uh, older adults. It's into their uh, topology of, of who they are. Now, is that modifiable? Possibly. Possibly because when a person is anxious, that's, that's sitting on top of a brainstem that is regulating physiology in a state of defense. And all the costs come with that. It means that the autonomic nervous system is not supporting homeostatic functions, so they get all these other types of disorders, whether cardiovascular or digestive. And of course, if they're anxious, they're misreading the cues of others. If they're misreading right. the cues of others, their social behavior is challenged. And the term I use, if they can't read the cues of others, their relationships are also biased. They lack this core possibility of co-regulation. Which makes it so important for like teachers to be the ones who are in a safe and social state to be yeah. able to provide that co-regulation, right? Yeah, but we would have to say that teachers are human beings as well. Sure, right? sure, sure. <laughs> Just like parents are human beings. Absolutely. And spouses or significant others. We we are human beings, which means even though we can see the cues coming at us of uh, hostility, reactivity, danger – our bodies have great difficulty in deflecting those or saying, oh, that's just because that person's anxious. We have feelings and we respond to them. And so we have to have a better awareness of those issues. Uh, in the school systems, what what is happening in the past, um, actually, year, there have been two books published focusing on polyvagal applications in classrooms. And one was done by a a teacher or a principal in in uh, the UK, and her model was it was really beautiful. She's saying that if a teacher goes to school and and has had a bad day at home, you know, got into a fight with her or significant other or her kids or something, and comes in and her face is not radiating or re responsive to children, not giving cues of safety to the child, then you start having a lot of acting out oppositional behavior within the classroom and that she was now going in and teaching teachers about the importance of their presence in the classroom and how it affected behavior and then there's another book that just came out and this book is on actually uh, disorders of uh, basically uh, the disorders that a lot of teachers see in terms of attentional problems and reactive behaviors. And again, going at the core that it's this inability to feel safe with another, to connect and to co-regulate. I'll have to read those books. I didn't know this came out. Um, yeah, I've done a couple of presentations to teachers about polyvagal theory in very simple terms. And again, it's just this instant, like oh that's what's happening and they can place the they can place the concepts to the certain kids and they know right off the bat and it brings this immediate sense of empathy yeah which is beautiful yeah, yeah. and actually i like to separate empathy and compassion mm. <laughs> i like to make a distinction although a lot of people 
don't necessarily agree nor do they have to agree with me. But with empathy, we, because of the science underneath empathy, it's really that we feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And when we feel that, sometimes we react to them. So if a person is in great pain and we feel that pain, we're not really positioned to give cues of support and safety to the person who is in great pain. And that's where I use the word compassion. And compassion is you're respectful of the other person's pain. You're, you, you acknowledge it, but you're there to witness and to support. And that's what I, I like it. I never thought about it that way. I like that. Thank you. You see, this is the scientist. The scientist says you can't have it both ways. You can't have, in a sense, brain circuits of empathy, which are very similar to being injured, and then mm. be, in a sense, a useful co-regulator to another because your body is going to show all those cues. And just visualize the person who is in distress um, now opening up and, and sharing that distress and seeing the pain in the other person's face. And so, in a sense, the survivor of, let's say, sexual trauma or abuse is now uh, divulging and sharing and requesting co-regulation to express the feelings. But as the person is doing that, that person is being functionally hurtful. At least his or her body knows that uh, it's being hurtful because of the other person's reactivity. The, the person, the victim, is being hurtful in the way that they're attempting to express that they need to uh, communicate? Well, no, it, it's being hurtful in in the response of the person they're communicating. So they're seeing in the face of the other. Gotcha. Uh, not an acceptance and a support, but they're seeing empathetic pain. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. Okay. As opposed to, say, a concern and listening and being present with the person to allow the expression of the feelings. The person that they're expressing to is now evaluating the behavior, saying, mm. oh, that's horrible, I, I feel the pain, that's horrible. And that doesn't help the survivor in feeling safe enough. The survivor's body is now saying, look, I mean, if, we, if the body said, look, the body would be saying, I've hurt someone again by just telling them. I'm just going to shut down and uh, not tell anyone. And this is really the history of what's happened to many, many people who have survived abuse. They just don't tell anyone. And I think part of it is that people aren't prepared to listen, to witness right. in a compassionate way. Absolutely. All right, I have a I have a handful of questions. We kind of went way off on some, which was fantastic, but I do have some planned questions. A okay. lot of people... We're very interested in my chat with you. I unfortunately, there's no way I can get to all of them. Yeah. Um, but I have a handful that I've selected. Hopefully, we can get into. Um, should so the first one is the vagus nerve. The polyvagal theory has really kind of spread out, and it's really I think tapping into a lot of different um, disciplines. Mm. But I'm seeing these things about stimulating the vagus nerve, healing mm. the vagus nerve, and I'm yeah. talking about. Let me. I'll give you a short list here: cold showers, using magnets. Fasting, probiotics, serotonin, gargling, coffee enemas, and even implantable vagus nerve stimulator Just, devices. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on these? Are these helpful? Are they trendy? What What, what is well, going on here? We have to. Uh, okay. Now the scientist is going to come out. Please. For a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> so we have to deconstruct even the first part of your your question. Okay. And that is basically healing or optimizing the vagus nerve. Okay. The vagus nerve is a conduit. It's a wire. That's not what we're really concerned about. We're concerned about the regulator that's sending signals through that wire and the impact of uh, those signals to the target organs and then the target organs through the sensory part of the vagus sending signals back to the brain. So we're more concerned with the feedback loop between organ and brainstem that's going through the vagus than the nerve itself. Mm. So we get caught up, and we, the term I use uh, is that we start giving executive function, decision-making right. properties right. to the nerve, and mm. we're literally um, obfuscating, blinding, covering up the real process, which is really regulatory system that is a feedback to, between brainstem structures and actually lower body or bodily organs. So the, the saying healing, it's not broken. It, it, it's almost, it, it's doing what it's supposed to, right? It's doing Depending what it's on doing. the history of the person who survived whatever they survived or... 
Well, let's say it could get certain feedback loops or, or defense strategies can literally be stuck because uh, they were there. So the, the bottom line is to think about feedback loops and ask the question, is the autonomic nervous system in the state of defense? Uh, and remember, we talk about two types of defense, one which is a defense that gives us energy to fight or flee, and another defense system that says all opportunities are gone, disappear. And again, as people go through these various things, they develop kind of hybrid models within their bodies. So they, yeah. in a sense, uh, their eyes roll up or they, they dissociate, they go someplace safe, but they don't pass out and they don't defecate on the spot. Right. But you start getting all these comorbidities, um, like irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, a lot of features of a body whose autonomic nervous system is no longer optimizing the human experience. So the first point is really take away this uh, intelligence to the nerve and understand, think more in terms of a feedback loop. The other part is be careful in terms of what is now called hacking the system. Yeah, We're trying yeah. to get into the system and understand that there are more, quote, natural ways uh, of performing neural exercises and those neural exercises that involve the vagus tend, tend to be relatively pleasant singing social interaction uh playing uh, with a person recipro syn reciprocally and synchronously so no, no magnets <laughs> well i don't think so i mean it, but you know as people start evaluating the notion of electromagnetic fields influencing neural transmission is not that far uh, out there. So, but it doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Right. And, and even the notion of vagal nerve stimuli with the implantable one, they're stimulating both the sensory pathways and the motor pathways. So if they crank it up too much, people get diarrhea and mm. impotency if they keep it lower it the information is going up and that's how it works and then the non uh surgical uh stimulators for the vagal system going in on the ear the external ear mm -hmm. and some are actually going on the neck um are going directly into the brainstem they're bypassing all these end organs but you get to those things by doing other things. You could like rocking, singing, as I said, you know, uh, uh, breathing. Pranayama yoga is mm. really uh, a yoga practice of the vagus. So you're through your breathing mechanisms, you're functionally turning on and off the vagal motor actions on the heart, and, and which means you're turning on and off the calming aspect of the vagus, developing a greater resilience. And those don't cost anything. They don't cost anything. That's right. It's just, <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. So, so do you think a lot of these things are more trendy, attempting to use words like biohack and polyvagal, and here's a thing that you can buy to heal? Well, the issue is you could use devices to optimize or to make more efficient a neural exercise. Let's say that you're doing breathing exercises and if you want them to be more efficient you could be tracking how the heart rate is changing with mm. breathing um so and the real there's an underlying simple model here is if you extend the duration of your exhale phase it's calming everyone knows that take a deep breath and they say exhale slowly yeah. because when you exhale slowly the vagal efferents motor fibers of the vagus work when you inhale slowly you're functionally taking them off so if you huff and puff do we calm down or do we get mobilized we get right. mobilized by turning off the vagus okay uh, so it, so now there, here's something that i'm attempting to make sense of we kind of touched on it but we have the three primary states of the autonomic nervous system the safety yeah. mobilization shutdown right or freeze yeah but then there's other things that I'm seeing um, that I'm categorizing as like secondary responses or coping skills mm -hmm. that come mm -hmm. after the states, I think. Yeah. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. So things like, and they're all, they all start with F, flop, fawn, faint, flooding, mm -hmm. fragment. And I've seen other ones yeah. that are, that are well, supposed to be responses to trauma okay. or to it, traumatic events. Okay, so 
uh, the flop or faint or sink could be, which is passing out, uh, is a natural part of uh, an adaptive response to death faint that mammals have. Not, not, I should say mammals have, but it doesn't mean that we all will pass out with the same stimulus. There are going to be a, va- a real range of individual differences, and that enables species to survive. So some people will pass out, some people will get mobilized, and some people will just kind of look at things and say, I can figure this out. So it's like – and under certain conditions, uh, two to three will 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 die anyway, you know, based upon the features of it. But the species will survive. So we have to think of these responses not as bad, but as adaptive. That's the first part. Sure. The second part of it is once it's adaptive, uh, fight flight mobilization, which is so inherent in our culture and understanding, um, people have no problem in understanding that. However shutting down people get confused and shutting down the real uh vagal reaction of shutting down is literally to pass out but not everyone passes out but they still have some of these immobilization features like a child who's yelled at by a teacher might just motorically freeze and be unable to move but the person still is erect they haven't passed out the blood pressure hasn't dropped Mm -hmm. because of the vagal surge but it doesn't mean that in the brainstem some of these features haven't started to come in. So there's a gradation uh, of, of hybrid relationships between maintaining a degree of sympathetic uh, activity for mobilization, for muscle tone, and for posture, and this immobilization aspect of shutting down. So if you flop and if you pass out, it, it's, you know, it's clearly this most ancient circuit. Uh, the part of that is that and again, for your experience in, in schools, individuals who may have experienced that, whether it was through abuse or even a medical procedure, their body's reaction is not to sit still. They can't deal with concepts of stillness. They can't right. deal with intimacy. So the body, if it goes into these now immobilization features, gets the cues. It says, uh-uh. It doesn't say uh-uh, but the body right, is right. saying it's really prone to shutting down. And the body retracts and starts to mobilize and to uh, do things. And what you would really see in, in the culture, the work that you do, is you'd see that these kids and young adults would be associated with high-risk behaviors. Absolutely. Which are always mobilized or, and also self-medicating with drugs and other types of addictive behaviors. Even Very to much. keep the physiology mobilized. Can, we, can you comment a little bit more on, on the on substance use, abuse, addiction, and how that relates to to the, our, the different states of the autonomic nervous system? Yeah. Well, let's start off by saying uh, what is the um, motivation, the incentive for, for addictive type behavior? It's a strategy to regulate state. I mean, it's as simple yeah. as that. The, and uh, the true addiction, whether there's a chemical addiction and where there's a certain... Uh, changes have occurred in the nervous system to create real addiction is secondary but the initial use of medications or drugs or for or any even addictive behavior is to regulate state so we start off there and what type of state is it usually doing it's usually protecting the individual from shutting down so it's saying if i'm even if i'm tired what happens to my body when i get tired i disappear I lose my boundaries. So if I keep running, I'll be okay. And in a way, a lot of the Mm. addictive behaviors go to that. And then we go even to alcohol abuse. And that is the loss of, in a sense, awareness of one's body and awareness of context. Right. Do you think that – I've I've done a good chunk of work in addiction. um, And most people will say that they use – in order to not feel, especially with marijuana, to yeah. not feel so anxious, um, mm-hmm. to decrease the amount of stress or ruminating thoughts or whatever. Yeah. Do you think that there's different drugs that serves different purposes when it comes to the nervous system? Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert in this, sure. but yes, some drugs are literally downers, as they would call them, <laughs> yeah. and some are uppers. And it 
probably has a lot to do with you know, what's going on uh, and what they can tolerate. I think a large number of people cannot tolerate immobilization. Right. And and I, I, I have this kind of like projective test. I ask people uh, what they think, how they conceptualize stillness. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now... For many people, stillness is the moment that you really look forward to, where time expands and creativity and intimacy occurs. But for other people, it's totally frightening. Mm -hmm. It's an abyss. So it becomes, or at least a fear of falling into the abyss, loss of boundary. So it becomes an interesting projective test to ask uh, how do people conceptualize or deal with stillness? Because it tells you whether or not they can deal with immobilization without fear. Right, right, right. Okay. Tell, okay, this is something I, I'm just personally extremely curious about, the role of psychiatry when it comes to the polyvagal theory. Well, you know, the role, you're yeah. asking whether... Medication in particular. Oh, you know, people, even some of my, you know, I, I am still affiliated, um, I'm still a professor in a psychiatry department. I've been uh, in a psychiatry department since 2001. Uh, you know, people have their biases. They're based upon what they were trained. They're, it creates a metaphor. The uh, In psychiatry, so much of it, especially in child psychiatry, is all associated about pharma, uh, pharmacological manipulation. Right. So you, you, you see their world. And they tend not to be as observant of the features that that I'm interested in, which is like, what does the face, what's the face showing you or telling you, what's the voice telling you, what's the orbital muscle around the eye, the orbicularis, what about auditory hypersensitivities, um, intonation of the individual's voice. This, They're not targeted to look at those things. So psychiatry, it needs a re-education. It's... Um, it's permeating the area. I give grand rounds and colloquia in departments of psychiatry. It's it's not rejected. It just doesn't have, uh, let me say, the warmest home for polyvagal theory in psychiatry or in mental health is actually in trauma because people who are in the area of trauma know that the existing models and treatments just haven't worked. And, and in part because they weren't They didn't provide an explanation that matched the survivor's experience. And what polyvagal Mm. theory does, it provides a narrative that's very consistent with what the clinicians hear their clients. And most, and I'm going to say most, at least many of the therapists in the area of trauma have trauma histories. So they're the ones that opened up their arms and invited me in uh, about polyvagal theory because they saw it as transformative in how they would relate to their their clients. Has there been, within psychiatry or, or any field, that has pushed back against this and said no? No, I, that hasn't happened. The, uh, it, you know, so like even in the area of cardiology, um, I was, I wrote a, a chapter on, uh, in a textbook, a handbook on neurocardiology. So people are becoming interested in this. But remember that in, in internal medicine and in all the subdisciplines of internal medicine, those have been organ specific disciplines and not neurally uh, informed. So people knew very little about neuroregulation in the area of cardiac function, cardiovascular physiology or or cardiovascular medicine, uh, cardiologists now are getting interested in your regulation. Now, it's been a slow trend, but they're getting there. Uh, the area of gastroenterology, I have collaborators there where we're showing that um, uh, autonomic, from this is looking at heart rate patterns, are very predictive of whether or not certain treatments are effective on gastroenter- gastri- gastric pain which is big in, in teenage and, and kids. So it's coming along, you know, as I've matured my initially, I, I thought, Hey, this is, this is a window. We all should open that window and, mm-hmm. and utilize the ideas and reorganize what we've done. But I was at that point, uh, totally insensitive 
to the way that other people thought. And I figured, oh, you, the metaphor was you build a better mousetrap, people, you know, come and get it, you know, because it's there. But that's mm. not totally true. People are, are vested in what they do. Uh, they have good intentions and they sure. have a degree of rigidity to protect what they've done. So over time, yes, it, it's permeating lots of areas of medicine and physiology. Uh, and it's moving into um, even, even areas of law. People got very interested in polyvagal wow. theory because of uh, – of people who've been raped, who have been mobilized and not fought off for a run. No they had no explanation. So these, it's starting to, in a sense, become a neurobiological explanation of a lot of, uh, let's say, sociological uh, phenomena. I'm noticing, um, I've been really obsessed with this stuff for the past year or so, on almost a daily basis, that I'm seeing these things. Like I went to my son's soccer game and there was a girl who did not want to go on the field. Yeah, and she stood there and did not move a muscle except for her eyes were looking around, and, yeah, and she was absolutely terrified. Yeah, and so for me, all I can see now is a is a girl in the free state who's looking yeah. for some sort of safety. Well, if you work with special needs kids like autistic oh, yeah. kids, and they start pushing these kids in, your heart just starts to palpitate watching these kids being pushed into these very fearful situations. They're already poised with you know defensiveness and this, and still they're pushed. Uh, because the intention is, quote, you got to break those blocks. But the problem is that the child's physiology is now in such a state of defense, you don't have a portal of engagement. All right, let me bring it back to the psychiatry again, um, just for a bit. What, so what happens now when we're medicating? If a, if a psych, oh. I've worked with many psychiatrists mm. um, in outpatient therapy. I was you know, intimately with treatment teams and whatnot. And so what's ha if, if they're not looking at things as as a body state and they're medicating the behavior, what's actually happening? Well, so okay, so their drugs affect physiology. Sure, right. Okay, and that's so in a way, what they're looking for is a down regulation of of arousal. I mean, they're using very global terms, uh, which they then will say it's calming the person down, the person can be more sociable. And that may or may not be true. There are some drugs that will calm people down, and they will just totally be isolated in their calmness. It's not like you calm them down, they'll be spontaneously engaging. There's other, other information that several drugs may impact on the neuroregulation of autonomic nervous system, meaning that your vagal tone may change. And when the vagal tone, this means the amount of information coming down the vagus, which enables you to both calm down and then to rapidly pull it off, to mobilize without using sympathetics, you may not have that same efficiency in regulating physiological state. But these are questions that psychiatry hasn't addressed because mm -hmm. it requires a different level of measurement. They have to measure the autonomic regulation of the individual on and off these drugs or he's use that in a way of titrating how much drug. And they only use information about if they start getting, uh, let's say, medical crises, if blood pressure drops too much. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they'll do an intervention. They'll take the person off of drugs. But many of the drugs will have an impact on autonomic nervous system and lowering reactivity or lowering sympathetic tone doesn't mean that you've now facilitated social engagement and vagal right. or parasympathetic control. It may or may not happen. Okay. Can it, let me switch topics here. Can there be, um, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Because there's a lot I want to get to. You know that. Um, can there be a... <laughs> Can there be a mixed state without the ventral vagal, the safe and social system, without being dominant? So play and stillness have the ventral vagal as yeah. the dominant safety keeper, well, right? Well, let's say it's accessible so that if there's an ambiguity of a cue, uh, then the ventral okay. vagus will you know, take the defense off of both mobilization sympathetic and the defense off of immobilization, allowing one to be intimate or calm in the presence of another. So someone who's in more of the, the dorsal vagal, the, the shutdown sort of free yeah. state, can they yeah. also somehow mix with... Sympathetic. Okay. Yeah. And that that is probably what freeze is versus shutdown. 
So there, there's this whole ambiguity because people use the word freeze when they really mean shutting down. Okay. So the mouse in the jaws of a cat is not frozen. It's just, it's just limp. And that is clearly the limp loss of muscle tone is a dorsal vagal response. The rigidity is much more, let's say, okay. mixed or complex. Okay. So when we're seeing freeze, it actually is, and it, uh, this is a, uh, I think I learned this from Peter Levine, the, um, the tonic immobility versus fear induced tonic immobility? Well, tonic immobility is, again, a complicated one. If you go into the animal literature, it often has rigidity of muscles. And the question of that is, is there a sympathetic tone? Again, we get caught into this conundrum in which the behaviors are phenomenological and no one put the electrodes on to measure the physiology. And so they're defining features from what they see. And I'm now, from that, I'm either going back to the work that I was involved in or guessing. And what I'm saying is that in general, it's like saying a cat before it pounces on a mouse is not moving, it's immobilized, but with great muscle tone. Now, is this similar to right. a deer which is now frozen in the headlights and can't move or munches uh, painting the scream? which is the inability even to get the sound out. But in both mm -hmm. those situations, whether it's a deer in the headlines or Munch's scream, the uh, deer and the person are still upright. And that means to me that the blood pressure receptors, the bowel receptors haven't triggered. And when they trigger, that gives you this massive dorsal vagal response that results in syncope. So I am, in a sense, making inference from the posture to say that there has to be a hybrid. I've got to try and wrap my mind around that. All right. So for freeze, is, is more of an actual stiffening? Is that kind of yeah, higher? Yeah, well, let, let's... The issue is freeze in the upright mm -hmm. uh, position. Now, I've seen mm. animals being frozen in, like birds, you can put them into a tonic immobility. It doesn't matter what position you put them in. Um, but birds are birds. They're not mammals. And mammals, when they go in a sense of more catatonic, and this is really part of what you're asking, yeah. um, there is a paper that someone wrote about a decade ago incorporating polyvagal theory as an explanation uh, for catatonic states. And it's, I believe, in psychology, psychological review. But I don't remember the total conclusion. It, the idea was that he was trying to incorporate a neurophysiological explanation for, again, phenomenological observations. And I think what's necessary is the real experiments to measure these autonomic functions. Fair enough. So in the more defensive states, well, let's, let's kind of switch to clinical disorders as mm -hmm. I think is what you said is as adaptations of defensive states. Yeah. Well, look, yeah. Before we go there, sure. let's say that the adaptation is a shifting of these more global autonomic states. And if we move into states of defense, which are mobilization with sympathetic or immobilization with dorsal vagus, we limit social in behavior, we limit social interactions. Right. It's because the social engagement system, which is the nerves that regulate the face, and including mm -hmm. our voice, uh, those uh, that system is linked to that ventral vagal system. So it's like, we, in a sense, we can't be calmed down. Right. And, and what that really means is that the person is now floating between, uh, has only these two defensive options. And you have to think of them as hierarchical. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the most primitive system is that dorsal vagus, and you inhibit that defensiveness by mobilizing, and that's what you see with oppositional and kids or kids yeah. doing high-risk behaviors. And then the newest system with ventral vagus keeps everything in its place, enabling these hybrid play and intimacy moments. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. So things like... ADHD, anxiety, depression, PTSD, they seem pretty obvious where they might fall on the on, on the hierarchy? Yeah, they all fall with a compromise to the social engagement system. Right. 
So this is where, you know, again, if we go into the earlier question about how does it fit within psychiatry, I would ask the other question, how does it fit within the funding trends of the National Institute of Mental Health? And the answer is since the social engagement system is depressed in many different clinical disorders, it wasn't the easiest stuff to get funded because what the NIMH was, it was in part driven by advocacy groups of different disorders. And okay. there's overlap. Now, I, I, during the years that I was running a large lab, I was always funded. So I'm not complaining, but I was saying that it was not the easiest journey to get funding when you're dealing with something that has a more global impact. So the, right. the measures and the features of lack of expressivity in the upper part of the face, lack of intonation of voice, auditory hypersensitivities, lower vagal regulation of the heart, you'd see this in virtually every right. major form of mental health problem. When I first heard you say that, it really blew my mind because you don't think about, I don't see those in the DSM. I don't see, yeah. no one talks about that in treatment team, but I, when I thought about it, like, oh yeah, that that's very true. That is a consistent yeah, it's Pattern. consistent at the lowest levels. But if you think of these as uh, that those features as being a platform upon which higher level mental health problems occur, in sense higher brain structures, you start getting into a world that says, well, if I have this physiological state, there'll be specific emergent, predictable emergent properties that now will be called different mental disorders. Now, if I can intervene at the level of the brainstem, if I can do these neural exercises, what happens to these higher level emergent properties? Does the person start losing symptomatology and in many cases, perhaps losing diagnosis? I, I would say yes. Um, I, I, I noticed with the kids I was working with in outpatient mental health that they had all kinds of diagnoses and I would look at the family history yeah. and I'd say, well, let's get this, you know, let's get this in order first. And then if their behaviors are still there, let's, we'll figure something else out. But once yeah. we did parenting skills, family therapy, the behaviors kind of got better. And yeah. There was more yeah. of a connection with the family. And, you know, once mm. you got the co-regulation going, the, mm. yeah, everything else kind of stopped. The magic word. As a species, we evolved to co-regulate. If we take that out of the equation, you get all these other behaviors. You get all because the body is trying to regulate its state and it's regulating it through defensive strategies because it's just yeah. not safe to interact. So that that has been the constant that I've seen with. I, I can't think of a kid where maybe a child who's been through one sort of acute trauma that mm. was separate from the family, just a thing they survived. Yeah. I, I can't think of a single kid I've worked with where there hasn't been some sort of disruption in the home where co-regulation was cut off um, mm. or a kid who didn't feel alone deep down inside that this was mm. always, always sort of present. Yeah, yeah. So how about with something like borderline personality disorder or, or that kind of behavioral stuff? Well, um, I think I think they're all, I think the manifestations of what we call things borderline or even, you know, the antecedents of, first of all, how many people with borderline diagnosis do not have a trauma history? Right, right. So you start seeing yeah. there's, a, there's a disruptor occurring somewhere, and that disruptor in my world is disruptor of the opportunities for, to co-regulate with a safe other, safe person. And so when you, and then if that's taken out of the context of the individual, you start having all these apparent types of self-regulatory strategies that result in diagnoses. Right. I, I think that, so I'm getting messages from people trying to understand, and I can't talk to them on an individual basis, of course, I can't do therapy like that, um, or outside of my state, but um, they you know, they want to understand where, what, if they're diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, that, you know, we're, not that that is exactly an indicator of what they're going through because the diagnosis does not necessarily match no. necessarily but uh, they want you know or dissociative identities personality mm. disorder um i'm sorry did mm. that they want to understand well what's happening inside of me yeah and, and i think do you do you feel comfortable is can we take these typical sort of general diagnoses and place them onto the polyvagal ladder i i think what you would find is that it really doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. 
that they share some common features. Right. And the common features have to do with state regulation. And in fact, the manifestation, whether it's DID or borderline, has to do with the strategy that the higher brain structures uh, developed to regulate their state. Mm-hmm. And, and in a sense, the personal narrative that then evolved mm-hmm. from those uh, psychological or mental ex- experiences. It, it, it almost the, the image I have in my head is this. I don't know why it's a ball of yarn, but the, we have the state, and then around the state forms all this the thoughts and the feelings and the, mm-hmm. the thoughts about the thoughts and the feelings about yeah. the thoughts, and yeah. and then all of a sudden that you know behavior changes and whatnot. And that's kind of is that. Is that yeah, a good I'd image for what you're what talking What you're about? doing in that image is really what I call personal narrative. Mm. So if we have these feelings. What do we make of those feelings? How do we how do we use those feelings yeah. to create a, a reality? And the, the issue is the personal narrative. When This is where polyvagal theory became useful to many people with a variety of disorders. It enabled them to inform their personal narrative that functionally – there was a reason why they were experiencing these things. Mm-hmm. And, and then a different reality would start. In a sense, it was a self-healing process. If the higher mm-hmm. brain structures, our cognitive, our sense of awareness, becomes attuned to what's going on in our body, and that makes sense in a psychoeducational way, then mm-hmm. it creates a container on top of those feelings. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So really it's... Um... All this stuff going on, plus the narrative, which is interwoven in there. Yeah. And then if someone like me will come along and say, oh, well, I'll call that this thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, remember, once you give people tools mm-hmm. uh, of understanding bodily feelings, the narrative starts to change. But the narrative has power as well, because the narrative provides top-down information to the brainstem area. So suddenly, uh, the narrative becomes a container of physiological reactivity because the internal uh, message is, oh, that's part of being a human being. That's part of our nervous system. Uh, and that's that was the other the other one is that those reactions can now be uh, described in our narrative as being our body's heroic attempt to save our lives. So. Definitely. And when that heroic attempt comes in, it's kind of like the story of a journey, a hero's journey, you know, Joseph Campbell type metaphor. The hero's journey makes us feel good. We're heroes. And this is the journey that we went on. And now it makes sense Mm. as opposed to being told on this evaluative level, you're exhibiting bad behavior. And that's really big in the school systems that you have bad behavior and you're dealing with people who are very vulnerable, young people, yeah. and those who exhibit bad behavior. Remember, this is formative years of how they see themselves and whether or not they feel shame and blame or guilt or or even break apart in a DID. You know, they say, I can't take any more of this negativity. I'm just going to be someone different, at least for a couple hours a day. With the, can I... Can I ask you a little bit more about DID? I don't know. If, I don't know how you know level of expertise when it comes to DID. This is something I've just recently started really learning more yeah. and more about. It almost seems like, and as I'm reading, you know, stories of people with DID, that there's could there be a, a different state assigned to different personalities? Yeah, I, or that alters? would be that would be a polyvagal explanation. Yeah, that that it's really a state driven different states associated with because i'm not i wouldn't view myself as an expert in this area but what you find out is that there's a social integrative component and then there are these aggressive components i mean basically the it and most dids don't have more than three Mm, entities so you start seeing that these can be described uh, they would call them temperaments but really what they're described by is really how powerful or what autonomic components are driving it. So I see DID as state driven or state dependent. But but it it seems obviously heavy 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 trauma or traumatic oh, yeah. events come along with that and, and mm-hmm. catapult right. Um, did it, so in, I, in your lectures you, you've mentioned how dissociation is. I, tell me if I'm wrong. Is decreased blood flow to the brain. I didn't say that. That wasn't I'll you? Say, okay. Well I, I well, I wouldn't use it like that, but I would okay. say that 
that maybe I've said that. Okay, so it's like <laughs> if you're going to go into a, a shutting down response, you have less blood flow. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it, the other part is I would say that dissociation is an adaptive feature that we use uh, in place of passing out. So I now have – so we may have had our first, you know, where we just – you know, we're, we're challenged and we passed yeah. out. And now we just go to a safe place. It's like the nervous system has this this valve. And it says, uh, you know, if you pass out, you could really get hurt. You could die. You could fall off of right. something. But if you just go someplace safe, no one's going to bother you. And they people may it, it, that may evolve. So dissociation... First of all, many, many people dissociate to various yeah. degrees. And some parts of it, we, we say, this is wonderful. You're, you're a creative. You're, you know, this is where you're going to come up with your ideas. But others violate the concept of being present. They, in the interaction, they just disappear on you. And you see this, of course, with kids. And they, those that do that, they're being yelled at more for doing that. And they're going further and further because... They have their bodies are protecting them. So the, the answer is very complicated in the area of dissociation. Sure. One, it's much more common. Two, there are gradations of it, which are probably quite natural in our life. And three, that real severe dissociative states have a major autonomic component because they can result in, in passing out and they can result in a total flatness of muscle tone and, and engagement. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, it's been about an hour. I want to be sensitive to your time. Okay. I, I, I so appreciate um, you giving me this time and I, I know this will be very valuable for my listeners. People are loving this stuff. I know you know that already, but well, oh, man. Let me let me share a little. First of okay. all, it's it, it's important to me to convey useful information that enable people to understand who they are as human beings. There's almost a strange metaphor. It's like when say uh, batteries not included in human beings, the manual wasn't included, right. and, and so it's really a a retrospective development of a manual of what it is to be a human being. And we polyvagal theory has some of these features and polyvagal theory is not a fixed theory. It's the evolving theory that people are contributing to as we learn more and more. So it's, it's a framework of thought yeah. about the human experience. I, I feel I, I'm assuming that at some point in our human history over through evolution that we lost this. Like it, it must have been within us oh. at some point. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's 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 there, and this is I think it's been there, and that's why uh, you find uh, elements of it in in ancient traditions. You find mm. elements of this in in rituals, which had a lot to do with chanting or vocalization or posture shifts. Uh, so there's a lot of polyvagal concepts that were there not just decades before the theory. But probably thousands mm. of years before. So there's there's a intuition of understanding or recovering uh, what it is to be a human being. Yeah. And the, the the other issue is the, this importance of reciprocity and interacting with another, and the respect that we as a species evolved not merely to be strong enough to be by ourselves, but strong enough to be our by ourselves when we needed to be, but with others. Uh, feel safe with others so that it's dyadic reciprocal interaction that seems to be minimized so in your experiences at school what the school should really have is their number one priority is the socialization of children so that they're comfortable with each other and can use each other as a co-regulator and feel trust and safety in that environment i'm working on it, dr borges it's your job <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again for your time. Um, I, 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 and I know all my listeners so so appreciate it. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me on your podcast. All right, have, have a good day. You too. Bye. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Nice microphone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, nice beard. Nice beard. Yeah. <laughs>